now with this setup, <coughs> we want to prove this Jensen's inequality. So, now what we want to do is we want to estimate this. And roll bound is easy, and we want to finally find the upper bound. And how do we prove this is a bit similar to how we prove the local lemma. <coughs> what we want to do is we want to basically estimate the probability of pi not happening, conditioning on the previous events not happening. If we know upper bound of this for each i, then you take the multiplication of i up to, say, n. <coughs> Let's say this, I mean, maybe we want to give some index that uh, we just said that i is a uh, so let's say we give a ordering of the indexes in i into one to say some number, say n. Then you multiply them all together, then you get the probability of none of the i happens. So we want to bound each of this term. Assuming there is some ordering on this index at i. So we fix i, and now what we want to do, we want to estimate this. Again, we can divide this into two. It's uh, always similar to local lemma proof. We can divide this into two things so that uh, one part is, Ill is independent of bi, and the other part is not independent of bi. <coughs> So first, I mean, in order to measure this, I mean, one can just measure this. So this is actually one minus this number. If we can find upper bound on this, then this is same as probability of pi not happening, assuming this. So we want to say lower bound this term. And let's say d0 is the event where this j is not related to i. And t1 is the ones which are dependent, I mean i is dependent on this pj. So this part become t0 and t1, I mean happening together, intersection of those two events. <coughs> Then what's the probability of pi happening, conditioning on t0 and t1? So, this is, if you just rewrite the probability, this is the formula from conditional probability. So, assuming this happened, and what's the probability of three of them all happen? <coughs> and here, d0 is something independent of p, pi, so it's easier to, con to deal with. And we know that the dependencies are, are somewhat weak, so I mean, there are intuitively more of this than this. This part is kind of negligible. So we can forget that this small part, then we get slightly smaller one. So compared to these two, this is smaller, this is bigger. So once we replace with a bigger one, then the entire thing gets smaller. <coughs> and this is probability that pi happen and t1 also happen, assuming t0 happen. Conditioning on t0 happen, this is what we want. And in order to use the fact that the pi and t0 are 
independent. We pull this out and we subtract the priority that is, I mean, this priority. So we know, so PI happen and say T1 happen. So this is what we want to measure. And that's simply this subtract this. And this part is the bi happen, but d1 doesn't happen. So we can rewrite it this way. <coughs> now what do we know? bi and d0 are independent. So this first part is just priority to bi. And see this. bi is an increasing event. bi is same as ai is subset of R. So if more elements are subset of R, more element, R contains more element, I mean, PI still holds. On the other hand, what's DI, D1 complement? This is complement of many PJ, where J and I are related and J is smaller than I. And you take the so complement, complement. So this is uh, I mean union event of many bj. And each of bj is increasing event. So this is increasing event. So this is increasing. And this is increasing event. And t0 is a uh, Intersection of many pi, I mean, override, I mean, the complement. And each of this is decreasing event, so this is decreasing event. And in section 6, we run the FKG inequality. One of the corollary of that is that uh, if you have a, I mean, pro probability of increasing event, assuming decreasing event, is at most the probability of the previous increasing event. So what we run is that if we have increasing event and decreasing event, then the multiplication is actually bigger than both of them happen at the same time. And you divide it by this and divide it by this, then you get this inequality. So, meaning that uh, this priority of pi, t1, t0, this is a most priority to pi intersection with t1 complement, which is because this D1 complement is nothing but uh, union of Pj, where J is smaller than I, I and J are related. And this is just uh, take the union bound, you take the probability of Pi intersection with Pj. So, this is bigger, so if you write it here, then what you get is this. <coughs> so what do we know? Now you, I mean, subtract this from one, then you get the priority of pi not happening, assuming t0 and t1 is upper bounded by 
so 1 minus this, the first term is 1 minus priority to bi, which is basically the priority of complement of bi, and plus this term. So let's give this name, say 8.2, which is the name I give in the lecture note. So now you, we use this to prove what we want. There are two inequalities that we want to prove, this and this. Let's first prove the first one. So what do we know? We know probability of bi complement is at least 1 minus epsilon. So, this right hand side can be written as priority of bi complement times 1 plus 1 over priority of bi under the bar and you write down this number. So we have this left hand side is at most this. But uh, because this is bigger than that, if you replace this with uh, 1 minus epsilon, this inequality still holds. The right hand side gets bigger. And what do we know? Comparing to 1 plus x and e to the x, we know this. So this is nothing, this is upper bounded by exponential of 1 over 1 minus epsilon summation of this joint probability. But what is this? Okay, before doing that, we now we do the multiplication. So this, so we order the order indexes in capital I. And from the smallest i to largest one, we multiply this left hand side one by one. And what do we get is the probability of all pi complement. No, sorry. Probability of, I mean, not, none of the bad events happen. Is at most product of each event not happen. And e to d, so we sum this up, then we actually get the, I mean, half of the times 1 over 1 minus epsilon summation i and j related. Here we have half because so, for fixed i, this contains all the i, j pair, where j is smaller than i. And we vary all i, so this, actually, if you take the product, and here we have a summation, i is from 1 to, say, n, then what we get is all, all ordered pair. All pairs where i is bigger than j. But here, this is a summation where, I mean, each i, j pair is counted twice. So let's say if you have a b2 and b3 counted, then b3, b2, b2, 3 counted when j is 2 and i is 3, and also when j is 3 and i is 2. Both is counted twice in this sum. So if you divide by 2, then that's exactly summation of this when i is 1 to n, you take the double summation, this summation and this summation. <coughs> and this is exactly what we want. And this is m, and this is e to d. What's this? Delta over 2, 1 minus epsilon. That's what we have it here. And of course, if delta is small, then this is close to 1. So that proves the first inequality. 
And for, for the second inequality, what we do is simply the following. So this is 1 minus probability of pi plus summation of this. <coughs> then, again, now you consider this as a x. Then this is at most exponential of minus probability of pi plus this summation. And now again you multiply them all together, then what you get is probability of none of the bad events happen is exponential of minus summation of P probability of pi <coughs> plus delta over 2 and this part is mu and of course ah yeah okay so this is what you get so which is exactly the second inequality that we wanted so now I mean we have this bound which is good when delta is small the lower bound is e to the negative mu or m and upper bound is m times this so this is good when delta is 0 of 1 and this is also good delta is when 0 of 1 but what if delta is not so small? Then, I mean, this bound becomes almost useless. So say if delta is bigger than say here, two mu, then this becomes bigger than one. So this becomes basically useless. So can you do something better? <coughs> uh, I mean, if you use second moment method, for example, we can actually check that the variation of, I mean, before we actually check that the variation of x is variation of, say, xi, and you sum the covariance of xi, xj, i and j are related then this part you know that each of them are independent random variables so it's smaller than pi so if you sum them up then it's at most expectation so it's a bit smaller than expectation and this part is expectation of xi xj minus expectation of xi expectation of xj that's the definition of covariance and this part is same as probability that bi and bj happen and this part is probability that bi happen and probability that bj happen you multiply them together and you have to only add these parts when i and j are i mean i mean dependent then this is obviously at most i mean this probability because pi and pj are both increasing event, so the latter part is small, and you add them, then that's at most delta. So variation is at most mu plus delta, and you use the second moment method, and this is same as probability that x is zero, where x is summation of xi, counts the number of bad events. xi is the indicator random variable for the event pi. Then second moment method gives this. So even if delta is as large as mu, as long as mu goes to infinity and delta is much smaller than mu square, then you can show that this is uh, probability going to zero. But uh, this is not exponential in mu, so this is 
I mean, somewhat weak. And actually, we can get a better bound using a variation of Yenten inequality. Say the extended Jensen inequality. So we consider the same setup where we have this index set i and we have random set r and bad, bad events p1 to b, p2 to, to I mean pi for each i inside of the index set capital I. And assuming say delta is bigger than mu, what we have is that we have that probability that none of the bad events happen is at most e to the negative mu square over 2 delta. So, what we want to do is roughly the following. So we want, we, from the previous Jensen inequality, we know that this is this, right? But what we know is that if we take a S, which is subset of I, we have this upper bound, right? So instead of finding upper bound on this, if you find upper bound on this term, then we get upper bound on here. Then, I mean, you might ask that, okay, we have uh, this inequality, then why do we even care about this S instead of I? One of the catch is that, uh, let's assume that S is random subset of I. Then, once we consider this S instead of I, then mu and delta changes. And let's say this, P, this S is uh, from I, if you randomly select each index to be inside of S with probability P. Then mu tends to become P mu, but delta actually tends to become P square delta. Because mu is what? Summation of probability of BI. And each of these term is there or not with probability P. But delta is summation of probability of BI and PJ, where IJ is in the set and they are related. And each term, if we consider S, each term is there with probability I mean, P, and both of them have to be there. So this actually deteriorates faster. So here, what was the problem? Delta was too big to apply the previous Yen-sense inequality. Yen-sense inequality is meaningful only when delta is small than mu. But here, mu, delta is too, small, too big. But if you go to this smaller set, and somehow mu is shrinked and delta is shrinked, but the delta shrinks much faster. But before, delta was big, but uh, by multiplying appropriate p, now this might be smaller than left-hand side. Then we might get uh, some meaningful inequality. Even though we lose something, by taking a subset, we actually can improve this upper bound. So that's intuition. That's how we will pursue. So we will use, uh, in order to pro prove a probability theorem, we want to use some probability method over this theorem. So let's make this more rigorous. So, <coughs> so let's say we fix a uh, set S, which is subset of I, which is an uh, index set, and we order the indices in S. With this, 
we know the previous analysis holds. So for example, this holds with this i and j both in s. So you can ask that the i and j in s, then this still holds. And we multiply all the, these all together. Then what do we get? The probability that the, all of the events in S does not happen <coughs> is so again similarly this is one minus probability of pi plus this part, which is I mean upper bounded by e to the uh, negative probability of pi plus the summation of probability of pi, pj. So you multiply them together, then what you get is e to the negative summation of probability of pi, i is in s, because we are multiplying over the indices in s, plus Oh no, uh, give me a moment. Yeah, plus half times summation of pi, I mean, probability of pi and pj happens, i and j related, both of them are in s. So this is what we get. Again, we have this half because of, I mean, considering the older term and non-older term. And you take the logarithm, you take the negative logarithm on both sides, then what do you get? Take the ten. Summation of probability of pi, i is in, in s minus half times this. So now we have this. But s was uh, for arbitrary set, but uh, now we consider random set. For each i, we add i to s with priority p and p will be determined later. For this random subset S, we can compute the expectation on the both sides. Expectation of this, expectation of this, then we get the inequality as well. So expectation of negative logarithm probability of this is expected sum of this minus half times expectation of this. But uh, what's this expectation? You have a, uh, for each probability of pi, and if you sum up for all i, then that's mu, and each term survives with probability p. So the, this is same as p mu. And here, each term, again, you take the i here, then you get delta. But the, each term now survives with probability p squared. So p squared delta. <coughs> now what you take? Take p, you take uh, as a uh, mu over delta. Then this is at least mu squared over 2 delta. So this being at least mu square over 2 delta means that there exists S such that negative logarithm probability of this thing, this exists. Now you take the exponential, you take the negative on both sides, and take the exponential, then what do you know? The desired property we want to measure is actually at most 
the none of the events in S happens, which is the most this upper bound that we wanted. So this finishes the proof for the extended Jensen's inequality. So we have this. Um, in the next video, we will a bit talk about this a bit more.